The following show is a Pod Avenue production. You are cordially invited to have dinner with the king. Pull up a chair and join WWE Hall of Famer Jerry the King Lawler and Glenn Moore. Enjoy. Jeez, King, I've been sitting here for about two hours waiting for you to come here and, and join me at your uh, at your barbecue spot, and you're late. Oh, no. How much have you eaten? <laughs> How much have you eaten in this two hours? Well, I, I walked in and... You're going to put me out of business. sat at the table waiting for you. I didn't want to eat before you got here, but one hour passed, hour and a half passed, so I went up to the... Uh, the, the cashier and I looked at the menu. I said yes, please. So she brought out everything out. But no, the I had. Entire menu. Oh my gosh. <laughs> when are you uh, going to pick up a check? Why do you always throw those little alligator arms whenever the check comes to the table? What are you talking about? I had I had to run. I had to get the podcast up last week. And then the week before, I, I had an important meeting. I had to, I had to run, buddy. I, I sorry, I, you know. Yeah, don't tell me anybody that you run anywhere, Glenn. I mean, I sent a picture. <laughs> I sent a picture. Of how much you ate last week, the Ripley's believe it or not, they sent back and said they don't believe it. I'm telling you, you you eat a lot. Well, I had the. Uh, what do you have? What are you gonna have now? We're about the to Southern start. Southern Champ eat? sandwich. Southern champ. Yeah, the grilled chicken breast. I found a good little little grilled chicken, a little healthier than the, the rude awakening I had last week. But yeah, <laughs> great. And the waffle fries are excellent. I'm going with the king. I'm 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 going, I'm going with the king today. The old standby, the just the pulled pork sandwich. I'm gonna. I'm going to, well, I can't say I'm going to eat light. Look at that thing. It's beautiful. But anyway, hey, enough about that. Let's get down to business. Let's talk some news, man. Hey, wait, wait, hang, hang on a second. Before before we do that, I just want to mention that, uh, you know, how deeply sad we all were to hear that uh, my good old buddy JR's uh, wife, Jan, who I've been n- knowing and been a great friend of for over 20 years, was involved in a really serious uh motorcycle or motor scooter accident apparently jan was uh, uh on her way to to work out at the gym and riding a little vespa scooter and apparently hit by another vehicle and i think there's a helmet law in oklahoma but anyways jan was not wearing a helmet and uh suffered multiple uh skull fractures apparently jr said and and uh it's not is it's really kind of touch and go right now. I know she's undergone a couple of surgeries, and we're just praying for Jan and thinking about it, and and wishing good old Jr. the best as well. So um, it will be keeping. I mean, I know you can check in with Jr. on his podcast and all of that sort of thing, and, and try to keep up to date uh, on Jan's condition through Jr. Yeah, and um, here in Cleveland, I want to say uh, I love something about Chandler Biggins, the promoter here in Cleveland, AIW, um, rushed to the hospital as well. And uh, good luck to him, and, and hopefully he uh, comes back from um, his uh, whatever injury he has or whatever he's going through with the Cleveland Clinic. So uh, get well, Chandler Biggins. Oh my gosh, it's just been it's just been a tough uh, tough week. I get, I'll tell you one thing that I've really noticed: when you get to be uh, age, all of a sudden, every time you turn around, somebody's passing away or dying or something bad is happening. It's just uh, health wise, it's just tough. I, I, I've got to go at twelve. Uh, as soon as we get through here, I've got to go at 12:30 uh, to the funeral home. My my one of my cousins just passed away the day before yesterday, and so uh, a great and a, a really good friend and a great uh, friend to WWE and a, and a fan and everything. Uh, Chris Siragusa, who took care of my condo down in Fort Myers for years, I've known Chris for 20 20 something years and everything just uh passed away unexpectedly this past thursday and so it's just uh man it's just been it's just been a rough time and it's just sad uh it's hard to transition uh from talking about that into some some wrestling topics but uh today's show is going to be mainly talking about heel mr mcmahon uh back in 1983 a lot a lot of people when you say heel mr mcmahon you know, think about the Montreal screw job and Brett screwed Brett in 97. But little do people know that we saw a glimpse of uh, heel Mr. McMahon in Memphis in 1993. So we're going to be talking about that. But first, some recent news. And Jerry, I got to ask you, did you see the videos of Paige released oh, oh, over the oh, weekend? Please, 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 Glenn. What? Take another bite of that. Uh, what are you having today? The uh, Southern Champ. Yeah. Take another bite. We're, let's. We're not going to talk about that. Please. You can't talk about that. 
I can, but I, I just don't think I just don't think it's appropriate. I mean, uh, did you did you are you telling me that you watched those videos? Well, moving on, Jerry, to that's what I thought. Okay, move, let's move moving on. Moving on. Did here here we are in 2017. <laughs> you are the host of the WWE Hall of Fame induction ceremony, which is going to be happening here in about a week and a half. Did you ever think that you would be standing at the podium and introducing Jim Cornette as a inductor to the WWE uh, Hall of Fame for the Rock and Roll Express? I I love Jim Cornette. I I love his podcast. I, we might not share the same political views as Jim Cornette, but <laughs> not at all. But the guy is entertaining to, to watch, to listen, his old stuff, his new stuff. I love his podcast. I'll plug it to the day I die. But you you and him go way back. He's a big fan of yours but when, before he got in the business. But, dude, considering all the history that Cornette has with WWE, all the bashing that Cornette has done over the years of WWE, <laughs> it's going to be a wild experience. You got a hot mic, a live mic with, with, with James uh, Jim Cornette. At a WWE event, I am my mind's blown, buddy. Oh yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be what would be the correct word to describe exactly what that's gonna be. Uh, there's a term we use in wrestling; it's a cluster something. I'm not sure, but and that that may what this uh, turns out to be. I, I'm not sure. I'm hoping for the best, though. I mean, I, I'm like I love Jim Cornette. Uh, I was just looking. Somebody tweeted out a picture last night that I saw on Twitter that uh, it was a picture. When Jim Cornette looks like he's about 13 or 14 years old in the picture, and he's wearing a Jerry Lawler T-shirt, and you know he grew up, uh, he grew up around our territory. He lived in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, he, he, you know he was at every one of our events. That's how he got himself into the business. He, f- he first became a photographer for us and a, sort of like a correspondent and that sort of thing. And then, and then next thing you know, uh, he's he's managing. And so you know I've known Jim his entire life. And uh, I, I'm really, uh, you know, like you said, you don't agree with everything he says. But the good thing about Jim is there is no filter. I mean, he says anything that comes into his mind. And I admire a guy like that. Uh, and so, yeah, he's he's been, I don't know if bitter is the is the proper way to uh, uh, to term his attitude towards the WWE. But uh, to say the least. He's like you said, he said some unpleasant things about the WWE and that's just, that's just Jim Cornette. That's just the way he feels and he's not going to hide his feelings. So when he gets on that stage, uh, on the WWE network with a live mic and all of the WWE superstars uh, out there looking him in the face and, and Vince McMahon there as well, there's no telling what Jim Cornette is going to say. I, I, you know, I almost feel bad for the rock and roll express. I, I think he may go on about a 15-minute tirade and then at the end say, oh, and by the way, here's the Rock and Roll Express. Uh, congratulations. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's just there's just no telling what he'll say. But whatever he says, I promise you it'll be entertaining. We, we all know, like, you know, Vince is a competitive guy. And we all heard the stories about Vince, you know, working out and the lack Glenn, of Glenn, – Come on, go, Glenn. You got a – there's like a piece of the, the bun or chicken or something right on your lip. There. Forget that. <laughs> I, I got sauce all over my face. Uh, sauce everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, we all know about, about Vince being competitive and, and, and being the kind of guy he is. It seems like as he's gotten older, um, you know, Kurt Angle is, is back with, you know, WWE. You know, Jim Cornette is going to be on the stage at a WWE event. You know, as Vince gets older, do you think, you know, not losing his competitive edge, but do you think maybe he's realizing that, you know, maybe not keeping some grudges and, you know, burying the hatch with a lot of people. Or is this the work of Triple H being more involved and in, in kind of being that middleman between people who have been away from WWE for a few years, for whatever reasons, to coming back? Uh, you know, there's a possibility for both. Just my own my own thinking is that it is, it is Vince himself. And, and Vince has always been the kind of guy. I mean, Vince is... You know, you can't argue with success. Vince is, bottom line, a great businessman. And I think a great businessman will never let his... It's real hard for them to let their personal feelings interfere with their business feelings. And so, um, 
you know, it, it, you can go back and look at any number of instances over the years where there have been, and, and you can't help but have hard feelings sometimes with, you know, with uh, with the person you're working for, uh, and and so there's been any number of different superstars or talent that have, you know, that have butted heads with Vince over the years, and that you can go back and see. Well, I mean, look, they they patched things up, they made amends, and and you know, usually that's Vince coming around and coming back to these people and saying, Hey, come on, you know, let's, let's, let's look at things from a business standpoint let's do what's best for business and let's do what's best for. And, and usually when you do what's best for business, you do what's best for everybody concerned because, you know, personal feelings, uh, they usually just wind up. I, I used to, I used to think that about a guy that I admired and, um, uh, was Bret Hart, you know, I mean, Bret and Vince were on, you know, opposite pages for such a long time. And I used to just sit back and think, man, poor Brett. I mean, you know, and I could see his point of view and I could see Vince's point of view. And all it was doing was costing everybody money in the, and, you know, over the years. And I just thought, man, the money that that Brett cost himself by, you know, holding out and not not going back in there and shaking hands with Vince. I mean, because eventually it happened. And then, you know, the money money was made again with Brett. But but uh, I'm just saying that usually when. When you uh, um, get those bad feelings behind you, the, the quicker you can do that, the better better off you are. And so I just think that probably Vince, in this case with Jim Cornette, said uh, – and I'm, I, I, don't, I don't believe for a minute that it was Vince's idea uh, you know, to have Cornette. But I'm sure that when uh, whoever either broached the idea or it may have been the Rock and Roll Express themselves, because I do know that they, they do ask uh, the different inductees – you know, who they would like to have um, uh, induct them. And so, uh, you know, if it, if it was the Rock and Roll Express, is, if it was their wish, th- that's just the kind of businessman Vince is. He just would say, hey, guys, that you know, you're going in the Hall of Fame. You get who you want to uh, introduce you. So uh, it, th- that may be of the way it came about. Or if somebody just suggested, hey, how entertaining would it be for, for uh, Jim Cornette to do it? The businessman Vince McMahon would would overrule the uh, the the side of Vince where where you know Cornette has said some bad things personally about him. The Vince the the business side would overrule that, and that's why we have Jim Cornette there. I think it's going to be great. Yeah, I think it's going to you know, and Cornette still has a large following. His podcasts are very very popular, so he's still relevant. Yeah, he does have a he does have a large following. Three finance companies, a couple of uh, <laughs> let's see, a couple of loan sharks. A couple of, he's got a big following to tell you the truth. <laughs> And, and and people want to see that, so they'll be tuning in to the uh, the Hall of Fame. I did, I, I did a radio interview a few weeks ago here in Memphis uh, with, and, and they called Jim Cornette, uh, and they were talking to him for about five minutes while I was on the phone waiting to be the next guest, and I had to listen to Jim do all his uh, all the Jerry Lawler one liners that he had heard me do over the years. He didn't save any of them for me to use, you know, when I got on the air. So I just wanted to throw that out there about his big following before he gets a chance to use it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, like I said, it'd be entertaining to watch. But I think ultimately, you know, this is not about Jim Cornette, but this is about the Rock and Roll Express and the, the work they've done over the years, Ricky Morton, Robert Gibson. This is going to be about them more than Cornette speaking because this ultimately is about the Rock and Roll Express. Yeah, and I mean, I'm sure you know the story. I hopefully that uh, I, well, I feel certain that Cornette or or Ricky or Robert will tell the story of how the Rock and Roll Express came into existence. Hold on, King. You know that, Hold on, King. That's next week's show, buddy. That's all next oh, okay, week's show. Okay. Yeah, we were to. Okay. Don't spoil try, it. Don't spoil you know, I try it. To get ahead of myself. Yeah, don't spoil it. You never it. did answer the question. Speaking of this week's show, did you watch the page videos or not? Come on. All right, so let's get into this week's topic for uh, this show. Um, <laughs> really quick, though, you're going to be signing autographs <laughs> WrestleMania weekend. Have another drink. Have another drink of that Diet Coke. Is that Diet you're drinking? I hope. Uh, no, I, I like the regular stuff, man. Um, you're going to be signing autographs at WrestleCon, correct? I am going to be there. Yes, I'm going to be signing some autographs at WrestleCon, uh, and I I did have um, uh, one session scheduled with with Jr. Uh, but now I, I'm not sure if Jr. is going to be able to be there or not. With the you know after Jan's accident, I certainly hope he can. That that Jan has improved enough that Jr. could be there. But uh, I am definitely going to be there a Friday morning early and going over and do the Hall of Fame Friday night, and then I'll be back there again Saturday morning. 
uh, signing and taking pictures and all that sort of stuff. That's a lot of fun. There's going to be so many people. I saw Triple H yesterday uh, doing an interview on ESPN, and it's just amazing the you know the amount of coverage that, that WrestleMania is getting. And when he was talking about all the you know all, all of the events that are going to be taking place WrestleMania week in Orlando, it's going to be. Uh, off the charts. I mean, there's going to be so many people there, so many things for everybody to do. So, uh, you know, if you hadn't made your plans yet, you better go ahead and make them now to attend and be, be in Orlando, uh, next week for WrestleMania week. It's going to be something. I'll be there. And, uh, hopefully we can, uh, sit down and do a show in Orlando together and be able to record. And maybe we'll have a surprise guest. Maybe we won't, maybe we will. Who knows? You know what? That's the thing I love about doing this podcast is we don't know what we're going to do next. Do we? At least I know I don't. So uh, that's 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 the fun of this thing. Are you uh, before we get to Vince McMahon? Are you signing uh, an access or no? Uh, I mean, I'm really not sure. I mean, you know, I'm promise you, I'm waiting on this. This coming Monday is when they usually give out everybody's you know total itinerary, and so that's when I'll know exactly what all I'm going to be doing, when and where. And you get your whole schedule, and uh, it's uh, it's always uh, a packed schedule for everybody. Well, the reason. The reason why I asked Jerry is because Jim Cornette is signing on Access, and if you're not, Jim Cornette is going to be at the Legends, <laughs> Legends side of the WWE Access signing autographs, and if you don't, geez, we'll never hear the end of it. From who? Him or me? <laughs> From him. It wouldn't. It wouldn't hurt my feelings. Yeah, no, you're right. He would. Uh, he would. Call, he would send out countless. He would send out more tweets about that than he does about Donald Trump, wouldn't he? I. I think so. I've. I've turned off retweets for Jim Cornette. I don't get his retweets. <laughs> I get his tweets, but not retweets. I can't. I can't stand that stuff. All right, let's get. I, I didn't even know you could do that. You mean you could turn off retweets? Yeah, you can go into the person's profile on Twitter, and you can. You can turn off their retweets, but you can still get their tweets. They're, you yeah. know, the original stuff, but they, you're not going to get all the, all the spam. Oh wow! Yeah. Look well, at next week you're going to have to show me how to do that. Uh, I just got a new phone. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I had a little incident. I lost my phone. I think. Oh boy. You know, everybody says, "Where'd you lose it?" Well, if I knew where I lost it, I'd go back and find it. <laughs> but I, uh, I think I left it in the back of a taxi cab. And it may have gone up under the seat or whatever. It never got turned on or anything. But uh, oh, no. so I just, I just yesterday got my, got got my new phone. So you're gonna have to show me how I can turn off retweets when we Jerry, get back to WrestleMania. What? So you lost your phone, and I'm reading right now on the internet. Jerry Lawler nudes are being posted right now. Somebody got your phone and posting all these pictures. Nah, no way. <laughs> You know what? I have I have that uh, what is the the little kill switch thing? If you yeah. you have that on your phone, yeah. Where you know if you ever lose your phone, you can it'll just it, next time it gets turned on, it just goes back to like it was when it came from the factory. There's absolutely nothing on it. Well, you, not that you, I needed that. Now, not that well, I needed that. Well, we saved a lot of people's uh, sight. Um, you know, locking your phone like that because we don't need pictures of you. You know, page style going out there. What there are pictures of me paid listen to you okay so that's that that means you talk about the page video so what did you think of them when you watched them and how many times did you watch them and where were you when you watched them and it, so go ahead to answer those questions glenn listen king we all know about that video that was out there you checking out Paige's ass on raw remember that, remember that one time remember that it video was that not, was out it there it's not a video it was just a picture Okay. It's just a photograph. So you're and, then, and then it was followed by one of her checking my derriere out in the locker room, too. You know, ah. so. Uh, but that was that, that, that whole thing was a joke. These videos you're talking about that you watched uh, <laughs> are obviously real. That's, uh, so tell me, did you watch or not? All right. Let's get into this week's topic. Okay. Change the subject. There you go. All right. <laughs> Heal Mr. McMahon. How could you have been so rude? That's Southern hospitality. How could you have been so rude? I mean, come on. I'm simply introduced and you people are booing. Why? Give me a break. Jerry Lawler starts running around the ring as I'm sitting at ringside, starts running around the ring, trips over his own feet, points the finger at me and blames me. I had nothing to do with it. Come on, Jerry Lawler, then from there you want to get in my face. Oh, your breath, you've got the worst case of halitosis, but you know what? Come to think of it, it smelled just like the Mid-South Coliseum. It smelled just like everyone in there smelled. I've never been insulted like I was this past Monday night. 
Never. And Jerry Lawler, you asked for it. And you got it. Now, before we start on that, do you even know where the... What do you mean by heel? What does that mean? A bad guy. It's uh, wrestling jargon. I'm, I'm, I'm in the business, right? I, I can use these terms. No, yeah. <laughs> You're in the business, okay. <laughs> so where, so where did it's, it's wrestling jargon? But where did the, what does the term heel mean? Do you know, other than bad guy, and, uh, the heel of a, of a of a of a foot or a shoe heel? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yep. that was like the, that was considered the lowest part of a person you know was the heel of your the heel of your shoe and so anybody that was as low as the heel of somebody's shoe they referred to this i think it probably started back in the 20s or 30s or something like that but anyway that's how people got to be referred to as a heel so though so that was that that was what that term meant and uh so we're going to talk about the heel mr mcmahon yeah but first we're obviously we're gonna be playing some uh heel Mr. McMahon promos throughout the uh, show. Um, but, you know, the reason why we can play those is because of the Memphis wrestling footage and the library. Yes. And it's not on the network. And I know there's a whole story that we're not going to get into. But, Jerry, do you have all that wrestling footage? Do you own that? Is it yours? or? Yes, I yes. Yes, I do. What's the what's the short the short story with this? The short story. I don't know if there's a short story, but you know, Jerry Jarrett and I started our own company in 1997. Broke away from Jerry. Broke away from uh, Nick Goulas, who had been promoting in throughout Tennessee in the Mid South for years and years. And anyway, and and ni- I said 97, 1977. Actually, uh, we went into business for ourselves, and then we. Just, you know, we started a weekly wrestling TV show. We have all of that footage, you know, all of those matches from 1977. We started out, called ourselves the CWA. Uh, man, some great talent uh, came down through Memphis through all those years. Went all the way through, uh, uh, I think, and it was like maybe 1988 or something like that. We changed over, uh, we changed our title from the CWA to the SWA. And uh, so then the the USWA came into existence in about 1980, I think 87 or 88, something like that. And that went up to 1996. And then, uh, in 96, I bought, I bought the, uh, uh, USWA and, and, and the, and basically the, the entire, uh, wrestling company from Jerry Jarrett, then turned around and sold the USWA to uh, a couple of guys, one guy from Cleveland, Ohio, and a guy from Las Vegas and or California somewhere. Anyway, they bought uh, that in '97 and proceeded to, uh, I don't know, they got into uh, some sort of disagreements, and they and they kind of went up, wound up going out of business shortly after that. So then, uh, more Memphis wrestling started up later on in '97 with Power Pro Wrestling and and. Uh, there's, there's, you know, there's been wrestling ever since. So, yes, I do own. Uh, I, uh, there's this, there's, you know, there's some controversy about the USWA footage, which would have been from eighty eight to ninety six, but uh, all the other from seventy seven to eighty eight and from ninety six on, yeah, I own that footage. Are you working on getting all that stuff in your possession, or is that just? Is yeah, that- well, I mean, I, I have, I have. I have had uh, talks with Ben Brown up in WWE, and yeah, the WWE wants the wants the Memphis footage to add to their collection. I think right now we're the we're the last remaining, you know, uh, yeah, territory, yeah, uh, of territory, yeah, that they that they don't have, and uh, you know, it's just sort of an ongoing negotiations. It's like. Uh, we talked really seriously for a while at one time, and and then uh, I don't know, just things went one way. There's just all sorts of right. things that come into play when you're talking about selling these states, you know. Uh, and it's not that it's anybody's asking too much money for them or anything. It's just that uh, uh, we're just you know just seeing where we are. As a matter of fact, that a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the one of the WWE officials said, "Hey, you need to get to Ben Brown wants to talk to you about the Memphis footage." So it's it's an ongoing process. And- but some of the stuff today you're going to get to hear uh, from that from that footage of heel Mr. McMahon, right? Right, and I, I, it is a vast collection of because a lot of people that we're going to talk about throughout these podcasts, you know, got their start their jump start in Memphis, and a lot of these matches, you know, Macho Man, Hulk Hogan, uh, a lot of these guys, 
people want to see their beginnings and they see all the WWE and WCW, ECW stuff, but they want to see, you know, the, the classic stuff. So I guess my final question when it comes to the library before we get Vince, you know, if you had to predict, will WWE fans be able to watch this stuff on the network in the future if you had to throw a prediction out there, Jerry? Yes, absolutely, without okay. a doubt. All right, sounds good. All right, heel Mr. McMahon. Now, this is a funny... You know, I did a lot of research in this. I know you lived through it, you know, years ago. But I watched the videos, um, you know, put some audio together. We sprinkle in throughout wait, wait, the wait, show. Wait, wait, wait. Are we, are well, we back okay. talking about Paige? <laughs> oh, no. No Paige. I was, you know, no video. You I didn't you watch the video. Oh, I, oh, you watched the Mr. McMahon videos. Okay, go ahead. Yes, Mr. McMahon videos. Yes. Now, you had a, a relationship, the USWA and WWF. We, we saw Bret Hart come into Memphis. You saw Giant Gonzalez, Owen Hart. You saw Jeff Jarrett uh, be a part on your side, you know, going against Vince and, and, and Bret and Owen and Giant Gonzalez. But the funny thing is, you know, this started the King of the Ring. Bret Hart won King of the Ring in 93. And you were coming out saying, I'm the, you know, why are you having a tournament? I'm the King of the Ring. And you brought on a... a, a, a a good guy, Mr. McMahon, on WWF television in the King's Court, and you were the bad guy. But in Memphis, Tennessee, when you guys were this thing, this whole this whole storyline, when you guys were going to Memphis, you would be the good guy, and Vince was the bad guy, ragging on Memphis fans, ragging on the city of Memphis, kind of like Andy Kaufman style. And then when it was in WWF. You know, people were chanting Burger King at you and being on the side of Bret Hart and, and Mr. McMahon. This is all the same storyline. I don't think there's anything been like that since then when you had, you know, two territories and two companies, same storyline intertwining and having the roles reversed every single time they went on each other's programs. I never I never seen that since. But it was that something that you and Vince talked about, you know, uh, with Vince being a face in WWF, but also being the heel and his heel promos. I mean, you guys get a chuckle out of that. Well, uh, we didn't get a chuckle out of it. We just we it came about because we thought it would be a great uh, business idea and a great business opportunity. And I think so many things came out of that 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 were oh gosh, not uh, unintended, but it just all worked out. Things that just happened. You know, I I talked uh, uh, some about the Andy Kaufman situation when I say you know when when. I went on David Letterman with Andy Kaufman, and absolutely none of that was planned. Nobody sat down and said, hey, I'm going to, to get up and slap you and all of this sort of stuff. But things it just naturally happened, and then so many things came out of that. And that's the same thing that happened with the fact that um, when, when, Vince, uh, when, when Vince McMahon and, and the WWF at the time, but when I, 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 you know, I'm just going to refer to it as WWE, which is what it is. So but when, the, when the WWE was becoming so dominant in the mid uh, 80s, they were, you know, because they had cable TV and they were taking over. And I, I don't mean to say they were taking over territories, but territories uh, were falling by the wayside because main talent, the big stars of the, all of these territories, wanted to be seen on that national uh, stage that Vince McMahon had to offer them. So the territories would lose their big stars. They would go to the WWE or, or WC, WCW. And and, the, and then that made the just the little small companies kind of dwindle up and and go out of business eventually. So we there in Memphis, we had a really strong TV show every Saturday morning on um, on WMC Channel five. I mean, we had millions and millions of viewers there in, in the Memphis in the Memphis area. And what what we did, the reason that we were able to stay in business was I didn't I was I was the main star there. And uh, the featured guy and the and and the guy that was on top, and I owned part of the territory, so I was not going to go to uh, Vince McMahon and the WWE, and I would, you know, because I would basically be uh, helping the demise of my own company. So we fought hard. I mean, we we you know, I sued Vince McMahon, and you talk, and there's another example of of people being at one time at at great odds against each other. I mean, when they first started using Harley Race as the king. Harley Race. Uh, some of the times they would just come into our, some of our towns and book him as the king, and 
and I sued him because I said it was, you know, I, I had the king of Memphis, the king of wrestling, and, and I had all that trademarked in the state of Tennessee. So I sued Vince McMahon. I had the, the, the receipts. The gates were held up one night in Jackson, Tennessee, uh, you know, for the show that they did. And so, uh, so at one time, we, we were as at, you know, at odds as we could be as, as far as two businessmen. But, but then um, later on, when I did start working with Vince, you know, we, we, we saw an opportunity to use that past relationship that was so uh, strange, uh, use it to our advantage. And during the, gosh, I guess from the mid 80s up until uh, 92 or so, I, I would go on TV every week and I would knock the WWE as, you know, as strong as I could. I would tell the fans in Memphis, you know, they're trying to put us out of business down here. You know, they're don't watch their shows. I, I can remember, honestly, um, you know, I was I was uh, divorced at the time and I was sending five hundred dollars a week to my ex-wife uh, for child support for my sons, Brian and Kevin. And, and I, I came over to their house one day and they had some WWE action figures. And oh my gosh, I, I, mean, I remember, man, I went through the roof. I, I raised total hell about the fact that, you know, here's the money that these people are trying to put me out of business and, and they're trying to take away the money that I'm sending you every week to support these kids. And you're spending that money on action figures to help them put me out of business. It was crazy, you know. So so uh, anyway, that's, that's how at odds we were at one time. And then... Um, so the people in Memphis and the people in our territory down there, the, a lot of them that, that liked our wrestling were anti WWE. So anybody that uh, you know was was with WWE, they they were against, and that that's how you know that's how we had programmed it there in, in our territory. So then when I finally did start working with Vince and we had the agreement that you know we could still run our territory, that would be a great place to bring along new talent for the WWE. When we started working together. Uh, it was just, it was in my eyes, it was just a natural to have, you know, some of the WWE guys come down and be, and work with us there in Memphis. But even though they were, even though they were big fan favorites in the WWE, they were going to automatically be at the heels, as you call it, uh, in Memphis, because our fans were just so programmed to dislike the WWE and everything associated with it. So that's how that, you know, that's how that, that uh, merger, so to speak, came about. And then, and I, I honestly can't remember whose idea it was um, to get Vince actually involved because at that time he had never done anything more than just, you know, be the uh, color commentator or be the uh, play-by-play guy there in the WWE. I mean, he may have had little altercations or anything, but I don't think he had done any physicality of any kind, uh, you know, as an announcer there in the WWE up until that time. And I finally uh, convinced Vince, or either he convinced me, as I say, I don't remember whose idea it was, but Vince came down to Memphis, had involved in a, uh, you know, a program that uh, I was doing with, with Bret Hart and, and gosh, Owen Hart. We had John Gonzalez come down, but, but Vince came down and, and, and became a part of that. And, that was his first involvement in, you know, in him himself being a featured part of a, of a, of a program. And I think he loved it. I think he just, you know, I think he really fell in love with that type of, uh, uh, you know, the, the in, not necessarily in because he didn't do the, the in ring stuff yet then, but, uh, but that, that involvement where he was really a part of the action as well as all the wrestlers. And so, uh, you know, and you can see what what sprang from there. I mean, I I really feel like that that was the beginning of the of the Mr. McMahon character that we've known to that we've grown to love and hate over the years. That was been so successful in his you know in his uh, feuds with Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock and all of that sort of stuff. I really feel like that Mr. McMahon character was born right there in Memphis, Tennessee, when we uh, you know when we did the cross promotion. Of the of the WWE in our Memphis company. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Mr. Vince McMahon. Well, 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 well. It's no secret I don't like Jerry Lawler, and it's no secret I don't like anybody who likes Jerry Lawler. Either. I'd like to introduce you a man standing in my right. 
right. His name is Pat Patterson, one of the all-time great wrestlers. And if you come close to me, you're going to answer to Pat Patterson. And also, it's kind of like the first taste of the Stooges when he had he had Pat Patterson. Uh, come with them. We all know about Gerald Briscoe and Pat Patterson being the quote unquote stooges for Mr. McMahon in the Attitude Era, but Pat Patterson came down as a kind of a bodyguard, and you were facing Paul Neighbors in a ambulance match, and Paul Neighbors was a referee, a crooked ref that you had a problem with in Memphis, and uh, Vince came down because you know he he thought you couldn't beat Paul Neighbors because you guaranteed. If I lose to Paul Neighbors, you know, I'll write everybody a check, you know, give them their money back for the ticket. Yes, and Vince yes. came down, and you were running around the ring with, with Paul, and, and Vince tripped you, and you confronted Vince, and, and Vince took off his jacket, and you, you threw Pat Patterson into the uh, into the into uh, the ring post, and he came up from behind you and grabbed you, and Vince took off his jacket and swung at you, and that was that was the first time that I think he ever got active. Uh, throw. I know it's a punch, but you know we all we all knew Vince as the goody goody, you know, announcer guy. And even back then, it wasn't announced that he was the owner of WWF or WWE. He was just the WWE announcer. Oh, so right, it was, right, exactly. He was just the Vince McMahon, the commentator. Yeah, and and it was so easy because it, it was like um, our Memphis fans were so loyal and so. Um, I don't know, so ingrained to to protect their their local heroes. All you had to do at that time, as we as we witnessed ten years before with Andy Kaufman, I mean, if you said anything derogatory about Memphis, about me, or about the Memphis fans, or about the South, even you were automatically a heel. You were automatically uh, despised. And man, Vince just Vince just took that and ran with it. But you know what? You're asking for it again. You're asking for it again because come tomorrow night, you're really going to get it. Come tomorrow night when the hitman Bret Hart, the former World Wrestling Federation champion, steps into the ring with you inside a steel cage. It's bye-bye Jerry Lawler. It's no more king because you never really were the king. I mean, these Memphians really can't believe that you are the king of wrestling. And if you ever did believe Jerry Lawler was the king, you're gonna find out differently. Because come tomorrow night, Bret Hart inside a steel cage will prove once and for all he is the undisputed king of wrestling. And by the way, as I think back to last Monday, I think about Jerry Lawler. I think about how he's been pulling the wool over your eyes here in Memphis for a long, long time. I mean, how gullible can you people get? Jerry Lawler says he's going to give you your money back if he doesn't defeat this poor pot-bellied referee and send him to the hospital. whoop de do. I'll tell you what, big mouth, Jerry Lawler. Why don't you put your money where your mouth is? Come tomorrow night in the steel cage match with Bret Hart. Why don't you say the very same thing? Come on, tough guy. Come on, big mouth. Why don't you say, if I lose the match to the hitman Bret Hart, I'll give you your money back. Why don't you say that, huh? Well, if you do say that, Jerry Lawler, which I doubt you will, but if you do, I think you're in for a big surprise i um yeah i love the end well we're gonna talk about andy coffin for many episodes but uh you know we're playing some audio of, of vince and you know making fun of memphis and your halitosis your bad breath that he said that you had <laughs> and uh, he didn't you know he didn't go all out andy coffin you know saying memphis tennessee and a hoot we farm no, no, but no. He, he didn't do that but <laughs> but it was very effective because you had so you know this man and a WWE, you know, announcer jacket, you know, sitting in front of a backdrop, all, you know, precise and proper, just ripping, ripping on on Memphis and and the fans and whatnot, and it was just great to see that, and um, you know, then you had Bret Hart come down, he had a cage match with Bret Hart, 
and Giant Gonzalez. Yeah, and, and, and you know, was a, the, the cool thing about that match with Bret Hart, I mean, Bret Hart was the, he was the biggest thing in the WWE at the time. He was their top, uh, you know, he was their top seller. He was the, he was the, uh, the Bret Hart or the Shawn Michaels or the, or the Rock of the WWE at that particular time in the early 90s. And he, everybody loved him. All over the world, they loved Bret Hart until he came to Memphis. And when he set foot on the, in the ring in Memphis, he was despised. He was booed. He told me later, he said, man, I couldn't, couldn't believe it. He said it was just amazing. But he said he had, had so much fun. He really enjoyed it. Uh, and his brother Owen came down for the match. We, as you said, we had a match with me and Brett in a cage. And uh, Vince had promised a big surprise for me that night. So there, as, the, as the match progressed, when I finally got the upper hand and, and had Brett going, suddenly out comes Owen Hart to try to climb into the cage. And, and then the next thing you know, he gets the door open and out comes Giant Gonzalez who was another, you know, at the time he was a big star there in the in the WWE. So that was the big surprise that Vince had sent down. And uh, Jeff Jarrett came out to kind of help me and even up the odds. So it was just it was just one of those situations that that uh, the, the atmosphere was so perfect for all of this stuff that that, you know, it just that I think Vince realized at the time this is going to be a great opportunity to send new new guys down here and work in this territory uh, in Memphis where they get a chance to work every single night of the week and they'll get a lot of experience in a short time and they'll get to be on TV doing live interviews and it was just a great training ground it's what you know it's what NXT is now before you know before they had the opportunity to have an NXT and of course this leads into one of the I think the you know the best uh, Mr. McMahon promo before Attitude Era, Mr. McMahon, but he did the death taxes and Randy Savage promo when he introduces Randy Savage. Even you Memphians know there are only three guarantees in life. Death, taxes, and Randy Savage. You actually lose the belt. And then uh, the next tape that is quote-unquote sent from New York to the TV studios in Memphis is a Mr. McMahon uh, wearing the the unified um, the unified belt. Un, I'm sorry, undisputed belt. Um, and, and him kind of relishing in the fact that he now, you know, a WWE announcer uh, now has the belt around his waist and he's gloating and, and bragging about it. And, and and at the time, you know, that's kind of was un, unseen, especially with, oh, it was, with, un, with it was unheard of. It was, un, yeah. it was unthinkable for, uh, you know, any, for anybody in a, a, a territory who they, that were fast disappearing at the time to be working hand in hand with Vince McMahon and the WWE, because that, 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 um, Oh, uh, the attitude that I was talking about is the same attitude that all the territories had. They all felt like, oh, my gosh, here's the WWE trying to put us all out of business. But then to see us, you know, the, in Memphis working along uh, hand in hand with Vince and, and seeing how successful it was, it was it was a one of a kind deal. It was the first and, and it really didn't happen. It didn't happen since then either. Why, the last time you saw this belt, it was around the waist of the... Uh of your king. It was around the waist of Jerry Lawler. But it's no longer around the waist of Jerry Lawler. Get a good look at it. And by the way, don't you think this belt looks much better around my slivet waist than it does around the rather rotund midsection of Jerry Lawler? But it looked best around the waist of Tatanka, the Native American that walked into Memphis Monday night undefeated and walked out of the ring undefeated and with the United Championship. And what are you going to do about it, Jerry Lawler? Nothing. You're not going to do one thing about it. I mean, Vince McMahon, right here, with this in my hands, Jerry Lawler, your championship belt. Yeah, it's yours. That's right. You can get a close-up of it. See, that's right. It's, it's Jerry Lawler's. Or I should say, 
it used to be Jerry Lawler. So, <laughs> no longer. And, Mr. Lawler, I'd like to remind you that um, this Monday night in the rematch with Tatanka, you've got one shot and one shot only to regain it. And we're gracious enough to give you that. Do you think you're going to win? Well, let me just say that uh, in history, there was something known as Custer's Last Stand this Monday night. <laughs> Jerry Lawler, it's your last stand. <laughs> and it's kind of, um, you know, not, I wouldn't say it's odd, but uh, kind of, kind of, you know, strange that, you know, Bret Hart was involved with the 93 Mr. McMahon persona, you know, being on the side of Mr. McMahon going against you in Memphis. And then, you know, when you say Mr. McMahon, you know, the character, people, you know, automatically think 97, the screw job. And who is involved with that? Bret Hart. Bret Hart, you know, involved in both in both programs. So, well, you know, and, and, and as we'll, we'll go back there in just a second. But another thing. Uh, you just, you know, we just heard Vince McMahon talking about taking it back to New York and Vince wearing the title and gloating with it and everything, which was one of my favorite interviews of all time. But then, uh, you know, Randy Savage was a guy that <laughs> later on jumped ship. He was doing, Randy was doing the commentary with Vince at the time. Randy jumped ship, goes over to WCW, and I wound up doing the commentary in New York with Vince McMahon. So that's that's why I say these things. You, you know, it was like it, you say they write themselves. You couldn't you couldn't write things like this. It just it, they just kind of came about and and uh, life imitated art, and it was amazing. It was it was uh, such a fun time uh, for me, especially you know to be doing things I mean really doing things that had never been done in the business before you know working uh, in one part of the country one way and then another part of the country the other way and 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 you know getting Vince McMahon involved which I think up until that time nobody thought something like that would ever happen so it was it was really a fun time when Macho and this is before Raw correct I mean this is way before Raw started so it wasn't like there was a wrestling show on, on Monday night it was more of the in your house style shows correct or if i'm right okay, okay. i know you're right that's you're exactly right okay so and so and you guys were on monday nights i mean you guys at the mid-south coliseum you're putting on shows monday night correct so you guys were the hit basically monday nights uh, of wrestling when it comes to the memphis area oh and that's the and that's what just i mean that was the thing that really um affected us the most because monday night had in memphis tennessee had always been considered wrestling night and you know people would load in their cars and come down to the mid-south coliseum and watch our shows every single monday night we didn't miss a monday uh, out of the entire year and so all of a sudden when monday night raw hit the airwaves uh, man we just really you know we just really took that as almost like a person why would they pick monday night they know that's our most successful night of the year and now you know people people can stay home and watch two hours of wrestling for free instead of having to come out to the Coliseum and watch it. So, you know, that was, it was a big deal to us. The fact that they were on Monday night and that was our, that was our biggest night of the uh, week too. I, I, I was, you know, preparing for this episode, watching you and uh, some stuff between you and Brett, even with, you know, in Memphis, but also WWF, because you had a long feud. You had the Burger King, you had some of the kiss my feet uh, matches. You had the, uh, you know, we're going to save the whole Bret Hart, you know, for a, episodes on its own but the whole Stu Hart the, the Hart family you know ragging on uh the Hart family but um geez Jerry you were you were stiff with Brett man I remember that, that cr <laughs> the crutch when you had the crutch and you came from behind and whacked Brett in the face and I I watched some uh, videos of a uh, Brett talking about it that was that was not you were not you were not uh you know, holding anything back. Well, let me tell you something. Let me let me let me tell you something. When Bret Hart put me in the sharpshooter, he wasn't holding anything back either. I thought he was going to literally break my back the the first time he got me in that. And and to be perfectly honest with you, um, I think there was no love lost there. I mean, you know, I didn't know that much about Bret. Bret didn't know that much about about me. You know, we had never worked together. We had never been in the same company or the same part of the country. But I think that Bret. Uh, I think his mindset was that it was kind of a come down for him being the top guy in the WWE to have to work with me. I mean, I, I really think he looked at that as almost not a slap 
in the face, but I just thought he, I just think he looked at that as not a, you know, not a serious type of uh, program that uh, with a with a real serious contender type person, and and I think a lot of people thought that from the, you know because I was looked at by that time, you know, the WWE was the biggest established thing, and we were still we were just the last remaining territory, and I was kind of looked at when I went up there. When I went to the WWE, as just a hey, you know, here's a here's just a, a local yokel territory type guy trying to come into the big time, you know. That's that's uh, I think that was a little bit of what the attitude that Brett had. So yeah, yeah we didn't, it, 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 and I I, I honestly uh, yeah I didn't hold back. I don't think Brett held back, and I and and the you know the things that I said about his parents, they they were not meant to be personal or anything they were just hey man i would go back i would i would look for rodney rodney dangerfield jokes i would look for Henry youngman jokes any anything about somebody being old and you know that's all all of those things were just just uh uh jokes but it, to brett uh i think brett took some of that personal at first uh, and but then he later told me that his parents you know that his parents came to him and, and said, "Oh, we, oh, we loved it when uh, when Cherry would say that stuff about us because it did, it involved them. It kind of put the spotlight on them uh, a little bit during that entire program. I mean, you know, they got they got to be on TV themselves. I remember to, I remember going out when we were we were doing a, I guess it was one of the when one of the early Raws we used to do in that Manhattan Center uh, there in New York City, and I remember going out." in the crowd up in the up in the balcony and there were there was Stu and Helen sitting there and I brought a microphone out and Brett was in the ring wrestling against Bam Bam Bigelow and all of a sudden the the, the house mic came on while while Brett was doing the match and I started insulting Stu and Helen insulting his parents but you know talking about how old they were and of course Brett finally jumps out of the jumps out of the ring and heads to the back tries to get upstairs to, to get me but uh, all, all of that stuff was, it, it, and of course, built in, it built into some great, it built into some great stuff with my foot match, and and you know, there, like you said, when we talk about Brett in the weeks to come, uh, there's great stories that go along with all with all of that stuff, and of course, his brother Owen, who was one of the greatest guys ever in the world. But uh, yeah, we got, I got some good stories about me and Brett. Vince, though, I mean, back to Vince, um, just the promos he shot. With in you know in '93 and then that four-year period to when everybody knows him at, as Mr. McMahon. I mean, if if he didn't do those that that Memphis you know that storyline in Memphis and do those heel promos, do you think that he you know still Mr. McMahon would have been born in '97 that transition to that character, or do you think you know that was just going to bound to happen in '97 even without '93 going on? <sighs> Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's absolutely impossible to answer that. Who could say? My my own personal feeling yeah. is no. I, I don't think I don't think if we had if we had never brought Vince McMahon down to Memphis and if we had never done that stuff, I don't think that he would have risked that reputation uh, damage to himself in in the WWE. You know what I mean? I, I think. Vince, Vince looked at going down to Memphis as something. Nobody's going to see that. Nobody's even going to hear about it. We can go down there and have some fun. We can go down there and experiment with some stuff, and and nobody will ever know about it. And and that's the way. And that's the way that that went down. And uh, and I honestly believe that had it not, it had Vince not enjoyed it so much, that um, no, I don't think he would have ever tried it uh, in the WWE without the without doing it somewhere else first. I, I know Vince, you know, been around wrestling before, and when he's just such a natural when it comes to doing promos, and I know he does a lot, a lot of, a lot of promos backstage and helping, you know, obviously helping the wrestlers today do promos, but just a, a natural in front of the camera. Well, he re- he really was, and it, and you know his role today is so much different. I really wish that uh, it was more like it used to be because you're right. He did really help, uh, you know, he used to help the young guys and, and, and give them pointers on interviews and just so many things, about, you know, on how to conduct themselves. But nowadays, of course, there's, you know, there's a whole staff of writers to help the guys with their interviews now. And Vince no longer does that. But if, as you said, Vince was just a, a natural at it and just uh, 
I, I so enjoyed doing commentary with Vince. It was so much fun. I mean, he was, you know, he would, he would always love to poke fun at himself, never took anything uh, too serious. I love the fact that I, he may not have thought so, but I always thought he was just like so over the top that it was just so entertaining. I mean, I just, I really, really enjoyed doing the commentary with, uh, with Vince. It was so, it was so much fun. And then, I mean, you know, all, that was just, that was just his forte. He was just, his, he was just a natural at it. And then to see him go from that into the character of Mr. McMahon, the, uh, as you call him, the heel Mr. McMahon, there, there was, there still to this day hasn't been anything match what, uh, you know, what that character did. They can try as they may to follow it, but it'll always be looked at as, oh, they're trying to be the, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to do what Mr. McMahon did. I mean, the, 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 the things with, with Stone Cold Steve Austin, uh, and, and the rock, but some of my, just little things. And I don't even know sometimes if people even remember, but just certain little things stand out in my mind. One of my all time favorite Mr. McMahon moments was when he was in the hospital with the broken leg. And, <laughs> and then all of a sudden Stone Cold Steve Austin comes in and, and starts pounding on his leg and then hits Mr. McMahon in the head with a bedpan. It was just, I mean, you know, to, and, and then, then the, you know, the, the, the time on the, on the show where he had the, the toy gun and Mr. McMahon peed his <laughs> pants. Oh my gosh. That, you know, the ability that he had to, to, uh, let other people get over on him, but at the same time, uh, not lose any of his own, uh, qualities there. It, it was just not many people can do that. And, and he has, has done it, you know, for so many years, he's like the, he's like the perfect heel character and he's just always has been as we wrap up the uh the show here about about vince um and and kind of relaying it to today would it take death to relieve mr mcmahon will vince mcmahon from his duties in wwe oh gosh another impossible to answer question but i'll i'll just give you my opinion on it yeah i don't think that vince uh even thinks about the word retirement, or even slowing down. I mean, the, 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 the WWE is his life, and, and, and he lives, sleeps, eats, and breathes the WWE, and that's the first thing he thinks about when he wakes up and the last thing he thinks about before he goes to sleep. And, and that has made the, you know, the company the success that it, that it is today. And so I just, and I'll bet you, uh, because I say the same thing myself, I'll bet you a million dollars you could ask Vince McMahon, well, how tough is your job? And I'll bet you that he'd say, I don't even have a job. I don't even work. It's like he is doing something that he truly loves. And there aren't many people that can say that, that they get to make a wonderful living and have a great life doing something that they absolutely love to do. And that's what Vince has, has been able to do. And I admit my, my crown is off to him in that respect. So I don't, you know, I don't think you're going to get anybody to say, hey, I want to quit doing uh, someday I want to quit doing what I love to do. Do you think Vince is going to listen to this podcast? Do you think he knows what a podcast is? Oh, I'm sure he knows what a podcast is. I, d I doubt he listens to mine. But, uh, no, I mean, Vince has got that, – that's that's another thing I think a lot of people uh, think, oh, you know, oh, what if Vince hears this? Or Vince has got so much on his plate and so many things and, and meetings and things that he has to deal with. You know, I don't think he concerns himself – uh, with uh, something as as trivial as somebody's podcast. Uh, he's got more important things to be doing than listening to people's podcasts. But I do think there are people out there that, uh, you know, would uh, that maybe work for Vince or whatever would say, if, if somebody said something that they thought was noteworthy to Vince, they might bring it, somebody else might bring it to his attention. And, you know, that's why uh, uh, I, I try to keep a lid on you, Glenn. I don't want you to just say anything too derogatory. I don't except, of course, when you're about to say about the page videos. You know, I know that's coming. <laughs> I know that is coming. I'm just looking down here at my watch. You're already. You're finished. Your food is gone. Yeah. You ate your last waffle fry there, and so I know. Yeah. It's coming. What 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 is it you want to say about it? Oh, uh, well, I do have something to say about it before we wrap the show up. I I want to know, and you know that you know on the first show you said 
We're not going to bring guests on. You know, you're not going to be asking your buddies to come on. If they want to come on, you know, they got to come and and come to us organically. But do you think we can get Vince on the show down the down the line, maybe for like five <laughs> minutes? Maybe, maybe. I, like really, for, I really thought you were about to say, do you think we could get Paige on the show? Oh, oh I'm gonna get Vince. We gotta get Vince on for like five minutes. Yeah, no, I, I do not think that that is going to be happening anytime soon because I'm certainly not going to ask him. Now, if you want to go up and, and get embarrassed by asking him, you can. But no, I don't. I don't think that's going to be happening. So don't, don't uh, be looking forward to that. Okay. <laughs> now I need to. Uh, well, I got a, I got a text alert, Jerry. How come you're sending me these videos to my phone? Um, why are you sending me these, these page videos? I don't, I don't need these videos on my phone. <laughs> that's, look, you see my phone sitting right here. I'm not doing that. I'm sure that's your phone service that is uh, that is keeping you supplied with your <laughs> with your weekly source of videos to watch. No, you know what? Hey, hey, this. It's, it, it, no, let me let me just say this about it. It's a, it's yeah. a really unfortunate situation. I I, I guess uh, it it's it's unfortunate. But you know what? Hey, the Kardashians made an empire out of elite sex tape. So who knows what's going to happen here? I, I certainly don't condone anybody putting out somebody else's uh, personal life out there in front of the world with their, without their consent. But, uh, hey, everybody has sex. Everybody. That's how we all got here. Uh, so, you know, sometimes I think people too, do make too big a deal out of something like that. But uh, what, what's going to happen here is, you know, I, hopefully it'll just all kind of uh, – die out nobody's nobody's been harmed or nobody's been hurt or anything so hopefully this will all just go away in a couple of weeks from now nobody will even remember it. i and i love Paige. you know i i she's talented in the ring um she's a, a very beautiful beautiful woman i know that you introduced me to her backstage uh at hell in the cell a couple of years ago i got a picture she's just absolutely a a, a charming young lady and um you know just reading some of the stuff her parents have been posting it's you know, this stuff will, will not go away. It's on people's phones and computers for the rest of you know their lives. But I hope people, you know, respect it as this person's a human being and they have feelings. And, you know, this is something against their will, not knowingly happen. And it's you know, I hope I hope Paige, you know, comes out with this, you know, a healthy person. And and hopefully people, you know, nerds in their basement can uh, can move on and and not keep badgering, badgering her about it. But uh, <laughs> right. yeah, Jerry, that's uh Make sure to follow the show on Twitter, uh, Dinner with King. We post some stuff during the week. We, you know, obviously we post the shows on iTunes and Stitcher and Google Play and Lipson and TuneIn Radio. So we're on all those platforms. We want to thank the tens of thousands of people who have listened to the show in the past couple of weeks. The numbers just keep going up uh, each and every week. We truly appreciate that. We want your uh, ideas for topics. Uh, you can tweet at us, uh, Dinner with King, or also email us, Dinner with the King at PodAvenue.com. Um, like I said, we because open as to. You, as you can tell, we have, no, we have no topic in mind when we come on here and start eating. <laughs> <laughs> All you're concerned about, then is not when do we get to dessert? Uh, I already had dessert. I had dessert first before you got here, and then. <laughs> oh my gosh! You know, then I had then I had the dinner. So you, you might be out. Of, you might be out. Um, of of, uh, of some food out in the back, so you may have to restock that, Jerry. But hey, buddy, I gotta run. I gotta get this uh, this episode up, and uh, we'll talk to everybody next week. See you, Jerry. Okay, see you, Glenn. And hey, instead of running, lay down and roll, Jelly Belly. You'll make better time. Next week on Dinner with the King. Rock and roll is forever. It's like that solid gold rock and roll. Two young men that really create excitement wherever they go. Robert Gibson and Rick Morton, the sensational tag team of the 80s. From Memphis, Tennessee, the Rock the Roll Express. The preceding show is a Pod Avenue production.